All right, welcome back to the program. As I said earlier, we will be looking at <laughs> updates around coronavirus, loss of fever. I did tell you at the beginning of the program that there are a lot of economic implications to diseases or disease outbreak. For, of course, for those of you that have been monitoring the show, that have been following me for a long while, there's always a cost implication to everything. And um, it's time for our conversation. The man at the helm of affairs at the NCDC, the Nigeria Center for Disease Control, Dr. Chikwe Ihekwazu, is here with me. He's the man in the midst of all this. Welcome, doctor. It's good to have you on the program again. Thanks, Nancy. Long time no see. How are you doing? Well, it's uh, a very busy period, like you can imagine, but uh, we're on top of it. Now, speak to me about the coronavirus. Hmm. Let me start. Is it in Nigeria? Uh, there's no, we haven't found any case in Nigeria so far. Uh, we've set up um, uh, architecture to be able to detect this. We can, our labs in here in Abuja, if there was to be a suspect case right now that would come into Nigeria that fit the, the case definition, we can right now take a sample, uh, get that sample to the National Reference Lab and provide our portal services colleagues an answer in four to six hours on if that's the case or not. So we haven't found a case yet, and we're confident in our ability to detect this if there were to be a case that fitted the case definition. Mm. Okay, I'll come back to our preparedness mm. a bit later. But explain to people what coronavirus is, really, you know, so that people will understand mm. what exactly it is. Yeah, so this is a new type of coronavirus. Coronavirus is actually a group of viruses of which there are a few. SARS, M, MERS are all types of this virus that have previously um, jumped the species barrier from animals to humans. Mm -hmm. So from time to time, there are lots of uh, viruses that are circulating in the animal world. And from time to time, one could skip and uh, start infecting humans, depending on contact. So this is really what has happened in China. Sometime in December, there was this uh, skip from animals to humans. We're still to find out what animal it is. And then transmission starts in humans. And so this is a new type of coronavirus. What we know about it at the moment, uh, there are two important variables with which we describe any virus. One is its transmissibility, i.e. its ability to move from one individual to another. The other is about, um, we call it the case fatality ratio, the number of people that die if they were to have, uh, get this virus. So for now, what we know about this virus, it seems to be fairly transmissible, uh, uh, but, you know, the case fatality ratio, the number of people that die from this virus is about 2%. And we think that will even get less. So uh, I think the key point for Nigeria is at this stage, this is a new virus. And with any new virus, there's a lot of anxiety. But it is definitely not the killer virus that is being reported in some uh, aspects of the media. It's not a killer virus of all, as of now. Does it mean that if one is infected with coronavirus, then you can get better? Yes. With treatment? Absolutely. Because I understand it's like it has flu-like symptoms yeah. and all of that. Does that mean if you're infected now with coronavirus, there's a likelihood to get better? So right now, over 80 to 80% 80 of cases would have a mild flu-like illness. What's a flu-like illness? A bit of cough, kata, uh, uh, sometimes a bit of fever. You might not even need any hospital admission at all. This is 80% of cases. Another 16% would have fairly severe symptoms i.e. would require hospitalization. Below, just about 2% have passed away from this. 2% uh, is an unfortunate proportion, but it's very low compared to many other uh, viruses that we know about. So uh, most people will recover without any uh, problems at all. Uh, uh, because as at uh, Wednesday, mm. um, there were 490 cases reported in terms of death toll. Yeah, that's yeah. Yes, but the infection still, that's the spread mm. is still rising, it's still spreading, over 20,000 of them. Mm. So are you saying that is negligible? Because I understand what you're trying to say in terms of the mathematics of it. So I, I'm not saying it's negligible by any stretch of imagination. Mm. This is an important new uh, disease um, uh, that has emerged in China. As we speak, 99% of all cases have been in China. Uh, Chinese authorities are working extremely hard uh, to get this virus under control, to get this outbreak under control in China. And the principles of outbreak uh, control are to control it at source. 
We've had some expectations in about 20 countries right now, but no sustained transmission in any of those countries. So we're working very hard uh, to manage this situation. It's a new virus, but uh, we mustn't uh, take our eyes off the ball mm -hmm. of real problems that we're dealing with every day in Nigeria, malaria, TB, Lassa. And so while we keep our eyes on this new virus, and make sure we learn as quickly as possible. It's also important not to take our eyes off the ball from current, present uh, challenges we have to our health security. In so Nigeria. with what you said earlier, there's no case right now in Nigeria. Yeah. And I think, at least as of now that I'm doing the show, no confirmed case in Africa no. yet. Yeah. Uh, because I, I was uh, listening to, I was watching a program on TV, mm. and uh, Nigeria, Nigeria, Senegal, and two other countries are forgotten in Africa, we actually, you know, praised in terms of these are countries in Africa that have labs, so to speak, uh, to take a look at it. Now, that leads me to preparedness. How prepared are we? So I, I think really this is something we've been preaching about. You don't prepare for war when the war has started, <laughs> right? Um, I think the great thing Nigeria did uh, around the time of the Ebola outbreak is I actually set up this new center that I'm privileged to lead, uh, the Nigeria Center for Disease Control, where we have a group of people that work, you know, 24-7 really to g make sure Nigeria is prepared, uh, both in terms of laboratory preparedness that you just mentioned, having uh, stockpiles of response commodities, having res rapid response teams that can uh, deploy in hours. But, you know, having said that, um, I I would also add that we are not getting the investments that we need to protect our health security. We, many aspects of the economy can do a lot more to support our work. Uh, right now, we have an outbreak. Many members of the private sector are getting in touch with us, asking for advice and how, what they can do. Um, a few months ago, I was reaching out to all of them to support the work that we can, we're doing in order to prepare for an event like this. We hardly get any response in those times. And th that is really when we need the help. Now there's an outbreak. Everybody is excited. Everybody is looking for support from NCDC. But when we reached out to the same players uh, in peacetime, you know, it thought about, OK, um, it's not uh, our problem. So it really is to balance, have a sense of balance that you know, the, the, this is also a risk to business, to the economy, to the country. And just like for every other thing, we also have to set aside uh, some investments to put into preparedness uh, so as not to be caught napping when there's an actual outbreak in front of us. Now, I'll still come back to that preparedness in a while, but let's talk about what uh, s preventive measures are on now mm. to for against coronavirus. Is at the airport? I haven't been to the airport yeah. in a while. Uh, at our entry mm. points and all of that, what, what are the preventive measures? So absolutely, uh, uh, the key aim of our uh, goal of our strategy at the moment is to prevent this virus from coming into Nigeria. Um, so we, we learn, one aim is therefore one activity is to learn as quickly as possible about the virus. So we have a, a coronavirus preparedness group at NCDC that is constantly reviewing new evidence as it's coming out. With that evidence, we are then advising our frontline health professionals. So if you come into the airport, uh, any of our major airports at the moment, you will see an intensified uh, screening at points of entry, especially the airports. All the thermal cameras are working both in Lagos and Abuja uh, uh, and, and, and uh, other airports. And if you're if the camera picks you up for having a fever, you're then called aside into a secondary uh, questioning area and you are asked about your travel history. There are no direct flights from uh, China mm. to Nigeria, so we have to elicit that history from people coming back. Ask them, uh, if you're coming through from uh, Ethiopian Airways, where did your journey originate from? Emirates, uh, Lufthansa, whatever other airline comes into Nigeria, they can come from any part of uh, China. So we ask secondary questions. The third strategy is to really advise Nigerians. And you would have seen we've um, uh, sent out three public health advisories in the last uh, week or so, really advising anyone that has come back from China that is well on arrival, because not everyone will have a fever as they're walking through the airport. If they're well on arrival, and then get ill, and they know they've been back from China within the last 14 days, to call us on our toll-free number, which is available on our website and all our advisories. And we will then come to you to collect the sample, because we don't want 
uh, people going into hospitals ill with this virus. Hospitals are, are great amplification sites uh, for viruses. So we will take a sample, we'll get it to the lab, test it, and if it's not uh, corona, I reassure you, if it is, uh, um, advise your next step. So uh, we have set up rapid response teams to do exactly this. So there are lots that we've put in place to ensure that um, we protect ourselves as much as possible. But final point, Nancy, uh, even if we do have a case, it's really not the end of the world. We have uh, setting up uh, plans right now as we speak on what to do to mitigate the impact of this new virus if uh, someone were to have it. In you know why I'm asking that question? Because we need to be careful, mm. not just careful. Uh, we know the peculiarity of our people, so mm. to speak, because some people will be like, okay, I'm feeling sick. You will just be going up and down. You go to the marketplace, you go everywhere with it. Um, explain, further explain to me, because I think I saw, was it on your website, where you said, if you have coronavirus, isolate yourself. What does that isolation mean? Because I interviewed a private sector person last week, the ND of a carrier asset, and he also raised that issue. That let's say you're coming back and you didn't feel sick within, but you now feel sick at home, you should isolate yourself, that that was not you know, too good. So expatiate on that. It's, it's very simple. It's just that in many other diseases, um, the, the advice we give is go to a hospital. So if you have fever, you think it's malaria, we always tell patients, listen, go to a hospital and get tested. And so people are struggling with the advice of uh, stay at home. So this is not really, when we say self-isolate, we're not saying cover yourself in waterproof or anything like that. We're just saying stay at home, right? Uh, don't let your wife hug you, uh, your children play on you. Stay in your room and call us and we will come to you, get a, uh, a sample taken and send it for testing. Uh, this, the key thing here is, have you come back from China in the last 14 days, really? Um, so we're not asking anyone with a cough or flu or fever to start calling and but really the critical thing, do you have a cough, a uh, flu-like illness, uh, a shortness of breath and all of that, and a fever? Uh, have you been to back from China in the last 14 days? Then you meet our case definition. Then we're ready to deploy resources to support uh, Let's talk about uh, health security. Now, I had a, an interview just a few months ago, I think in November. She will need with your budget and uh, Sarah Mark have won Africa. Just let's take a look at it and, and listen. About it. Um, as a country and as uh, people, we, we, we try to be apply reactive measures to everything. And in the end, um, because when emergencies happen, we don't have structures to even manage them. We find out that we, in our own view of budget, either when it was flooding or either way where it was Ebola, we find out that we spend so much with so, much, so little accountability. Mm -hmm. And so there's so much wastage. And you're even trying to jump all the rules. You're trying to say, OK, um, we can't go through a 45-day procurement cycle. We need to get this going now, now, now. So we think that all that, all that space. But I feel like prevention for us is about, it's about saving money, it's about saving lives. And because you also don't know the scale of what it could be, look how very lucky we were with the Ebola. I mean, in terms of the guy coming in through and help out, he could have just walked through a, a been, been, been in Republic border, mm -hmm. and before you know, and he, he fell down in Orile, and then 100 people tried to touch him and say, oh, this is what happened. And so in terms of the way that we need to think through more about, we want to save more lives of Nigerians. And we also want to save more, much more money. Because I see that when times when things come up in emergencies where we have not prepared, there's so much wastage, there's so much corruption. You think that people are trying to solve the problem or trying to mitigate the issues, but everybody's trying to still make much more cuts for themselves. And that's the way I, I seek it from a pris fiscal prism, that it's better we put structures in place to prevent issues, things from happening. Sarah, you want to come in there? You know, one of the things about epidemics is that it really takes away all the gains we make on economic development, our GDP growth, trade, tourism, um, foreign direct the investment. investment yeah. We yeah. saw what Ebola did to the countries of Liberia, Sierra Leone, yeah. how much their GDP fell. Yeah. And they've not recovered. And they've not recovered. So what we're trying to say is having a response to the epidemic before it happens actually saves us not just resources, but yeah. also our own, our own um, future, yeah. right? So how do we set up 
labs and states? How do we address cholera, um, smallpox, mm -hmm. uh, monkeypox, mm -hmm. lasso fever within states today? So tomorrow, we're not, as Xiao mentioned, running helter-skelter, mm. reactively. Mm. We're responding proactively. Yeah. And I think that's really where, what we're here to talk about. Mm. How do we proactively respond to these things today? Doctor, that was the show I had just two, three months ago, as if I knew something like this was going to happen in terms of we need to prepare. What's your response to that? So I, I couldn't have put it more articulately than the two colleagues that you had on. You know, um, I think for once in, in Nigeria, the Nigerian government needs to actually be recommended because they've, they have invested in setting up NCC. They've put some money behind it. We've recruited some staff. We're training our teams. But, you know, health security is not the government's problem alone. It's a whole society's uh, problem. And, you know, I, I do think we have to broaden out this remiss that government will solve all our problems, you know, and, and really bring entire society, the private sector, not-for-profits, our religious bodies, social uh, organizations, into focusing on health security and working with us. And we've actually been reaching out to groups to say, listen, uh, everyone can help. You know, if you have a logistics company in Nigeria, you can help us move things around mm -hmm. the country, provide us a uh, way housing for uh, stockpiling. If you have a telecommunications firm, you can help us with uh, um, making communication easier for us, reducing what our colleagues, we have surveillance officers in every local government. We have to buy airtime for them, data packages at commercial rates and uh, for something that's a social service. Mm. So uh, any of the big telcos in Nigeria can come up and say, listen, let me just not, I'm not giving you money. Mm. Let me subsidize your communication costs because those communica that communication will help save our company. So these are the things we're really uh, looking out to support from the entire uh, economy to support us in, in building our capacity to protect the country. Let's go back a, a bit to mm. Corona before we come to Lassa fever. Mm. Do you think that coronavirus will get to the pandemic stage? Because I know there are uh, uh, stages. Do you think so? So it's already pandemic? Uh, no, it's not yet yeah. uh, a pandemic, but this is really a critical time mm. at uh, our response, you know? Um, China can be criticized for many things, but one thing they can absolutely not be criticized about is the response Tell they me. have provided for this outbreak. You know, their response, they've gone over and beyond uh, the call of duty in terms of what they're doing. Uh, as far as we can see, um, you know, some of the videos have been shown online in terms of the hospital, but there, there are many other factors and uh, response measures. That, so really, the, the key thing is, can we... Uh, manage this outbreak at source as much as possible. And if we don't, then we start talking about uh, mitigation. But we're still in a phase of trying to contain. Contain it. Mm. Why the upsurge in the number of cases of Lassa fever? Mm. Uh, why is Lassa fever still there? Because mm. Lassa fever, we've been having it in Nigeria, at least with the little knowledge that I have. Perhaps it probably originated from here. Who knows? Mm. But why? Have we not been able to contain it? Yeah, so Nancy, I remember a, a great video you showed in one of your previous yes. shows. On, on I think La I'll show it again <laughs> if there's time. Oh, Lassa, you yeah. know, Lassa, the challenge is that the host animal is a rat, rat. right? And uh, this virus doesn't kill those rats. So it circulates among rat populations. And as long as rats have access to our foods, um, we will continue to have Lassa until we have the tools like a vaccine, uh, to interrupt transmission. So uh, we keep, you know, when you see, I see, I saw my neighbor uh, uh, or somewhere uh, close to where uh, I live at the moment, uh, and there was a bit of rubbish on the road, and I saw him, you know, walking home, uh, stepping over that rubbish and going into his house and thinking, okay, uh, I have avoided the problem. No, you haven't avoided the problem. As long as we ignore those things that attract uh, rats into our homes and our neighborhoods and think that we can build our walls in a way that to protect ourselves. Um, it doesn't work. So we have to keep uh, doing the thing that we can do to prevent uh, rats from getting into our neighborhoods. But there is some good news, uh, Nancy, you know. Um, this year, yes, we've had 
uh, over 300 cases, cases already, yeah. uh, more than we've ever had by this time of the year. But the good news is that we've had much fewer deaths. So we've had uh, up to date 47 deaths. So we've reduced the case fatality ratio for Lhasa in Nigeria from about 24, 25% to about 15%. It's still a lot of people, people 40 yes. 47 is a lot, but really we're getting better at detecting, we're getting better at um, uh, providing care, people are coming in earlier for treatment, so the system is working. And the, the best news is that there is a vaccine now that has gone into phase one trials, and we're working with the partners abroad um, to develop trials in Nigeria because you can only try a new vaccine yeah, where, where the disease is, yes. is happening. So we're going to... Just like the uh, coronavirus yes, vaccine uh, absolutely. tried now. Yeah, so we're going to uh, start trials for that vaccine in a few, uh, in about a few months uh, to a year and then see whether we have a new tool in our arsenal uh, against this virus. How many states have uh, Lassa fever now? So at the, the moment, updates. I think mm. we've report confirmed the case in 23 states. So it's definitely, That's a lot. it's a lot, but you know, 70% of the cases are still around uh, three states, Ondo, Edo, and Eboi. Boy. But you know, I don't want to stigmatize these states. These states, what is actually happening is the doctors in these states now uh, are aware that there's Lassa around. They're sending their samples for testing. We're testing, providing them results. So, um, you know, uh, we're really encouraging doctors everywhere to trust the system. Uh, we have five labs now that are able to diagnose Lhasa. We have an arrangement with the private courier company that we have trained to collect those samples from any state capital in Nigeria to take it to the lab. So we've made it as easy as possible uh, for Nigerian doctors to diagnose patients. But, you know, there's a lot of skepticism about the system, mm. especially uh, the mm. public sector in Nigeria. So we're really urging uh, colleagues to trust the system. We can provide you that diagnosis. You know what your patient has, and then you can provide uh, appropriate Is treatment. Is NCDC working with the three states, particularly Ondo, Eboye, uh, and um, what's Edo state, yeah. those three states, mm. particularly since we have higher rates there? Are you working with the governments of those states to, to actually know why we have so much prevalence in that state? Yeah, so we're, we're doing a lot and of... And perhaps other states too, because yeah. like you said, 23. Yeah, no, we're working with all state governments, uh, especially these three, because, you know, they understand the burden. And actually, the governor of uh, Ondo State was really being uh, encouraged. He's provided a lot of resources for the response and is now being very proactive in leading the team to understand the circumstances, uh, supporting local governments in clearing refuse, in, especially in the, in the Owa area. So there's a lot of work happening, but you know, this is a, a marathon, uh, Nancy. There's no magic bullet here. We just have to keep at it and make sure that we continue uh, preparing and responding. Is there a period of the year the outbreak reemerges or disease rises? Because even from my only mm -hmm. two observation and research, like, yeah, so it's, al it's always yeah, the first three months, three of, months the of the year. And, and this is thought to be an ecological factor around okay. when uh, food gets scarce for rats because of the change of weather uh, in their normal habitat. Uh, so, you know, everywhere becomes dry. They start looking for food in other places, start going into homes and things like that. And it's, um, yeah, if you look at the charts, our charts, we produce charts every week, updated data on, on Lhasa and um, every single year we've had a peak around uh, between January and March. Mm. Um, the surveillance to reduce the endemic nature of Lassa fever, mm. how strong is it? Since we have it in 23 states, mm. what surveillance tools or what surveillance mm. measures are you putting in place to help reduce mm. it? Mm. So that now that you know that it's always happening the first three months of the year, can we be better prepared? Mm. So this is really one of the uh, Lassa uh, surveillance architecture for Lassa is probably one of the most developed for any of the diseases and probably one of the most developed in the world. The, the challenge now is, you know, to set up a new lab for Lassa. Uh, it's a molecular lab. It's a fairly complex setup. Apart from the procurement of the equipment, you have to train the people in a very uh, specific skill. So it's not, uh, it's not plug and play. Um, mm. It costs a lot of money, about 100, 150 million naira for a single lab and a lot of training. So what we're doing is really, we're up to five now. Our goal is to keep increasing this and get people trained in the diagnosis, uh, develop a supply chain for the reagents, uh, get more Nigerian private sector involved in some of these commodities that we need in the labs. And then we get it to flow. And the easier it is for a doctor, a healthcare worker to send a sample, 
the easier they will do that, you know, uh, the more likely it is that they will do that. When it's complex, uh, people think, okay, uh, let me just uh, try this treatment. If it doesn't work out, try the other one. Uh, but we're telling colleagues, listen, that trial and error can lead uh, a patient to lose his or her life, actually. So uh, send us the sample. We will provide you the results. And with that, we will I also improve our surveillance and knowledge about the disease. How, mu how much threat is perhaps Lassa fever or perhaps some of these epidemics mm. posing to the economy? Because mm. when I was even studying on my own, mm. I realized, for example, Lassa fever, um, f if we take a look at perhaps processing companies or even these states which we've talked about, mm. most of them, which country, in the, uh, which, which state in Nigeria doesn't eat gari, mm. for example? So you can see our processing system, people would even want to shun gari. Mm in the market, yeah. that's an economic Absolutely. implication. Absolutely. That's just the tiniest, so that if people will understand what I'm saying, so that people don't say you're yeah, talking health. Okay. Everything has an economic implication. So what are the threats, especially mm. to the Nigerian economy, around mm. epidemics, around perhaps when it grows to the pandemic stage, what do we need to do? Perhaps if we sound that these are the threats, people really understand what yeah. we're saying. Because people look at it, it's just like it's health, or it's just you, when it affects that person, it's just the person. No, so I think the biggest threat with uh, outbreaks and epidemics are really the disruptive nature. Mm. You know, people forget that during the Ebola response, schools were closed uh, yeah. for two months. So imagine the impact of that on our education calendar. Of course, we have caught up. But, you know, we don't want that to be happening. Our kids were at home. Instead of being in school, we kept them at home. So um, outbreaks can be very disruptive and take away resources from all the development efforts that we're making. But this is also our biggest challenge at NCDC, is that, you know, um, it's, it's hard for politicians, our political leaders, to take credit in prevention. Because it's hard to go out to uh, your campaigns, as our leaders do, and say, because of my mm. efforts, I prevented mm -hmm. uh, three outbreaks. So it's kind of difficult, uh, a, a difficult sell. But we're, we're really encouraging mm. everyone, listen, what we want is for companies, the economy, uh, CBN, everyone, every actor in the Nigerian economy to go to bed at night and sleep. Uh, reassured that um, if there was to be a problem, that there's a, a group of Nigerians working 24-7 to keep them uh, safe. But for us to get to that stage, we really need to think about our response during, uh, before uh, the outbreak and make sure, just as we set aside uh, some funds to provide uh, fire extinguishers in our home, uh, check the tires of our vehicles before we travel, is the same way we have to invest in our health security before there's an outbreak. Not how about, about the budgeting? What does your budgeting look like? I know I discussed it in November or so, and my guest also did converse for perhaps more financing for the NCDC to ensure health security. I know you are wearing the hat of a public official now, but <laughs> but would you, what would you like to see? So, you know, um, there's no doubt about it. Uh, mm. To provide health security in Nigeria, we need to invest in it. Uh, we have, government has increased our funding to some extent, but really, we need to really scale this. I mean, to give you a comparison, you know, uh, NCDC has 250 people working for it. Um, the US CDC has mm. 15,000 people working for it. It's a slightly bigger country than ours, but not that much bigger. So if we want to really get serious about health security, we need to put some more money behind it. Uh, and we're not asking for money to be thrown at everything, because our work is actually very difficult. There are many things that money can solve. It takes a longer term investment. But beyond government, Nancy, uh, my key message today uh, really is that this is a, a whole society uh, responsibility. And especially corporate Nigeria, um, they need to see the Im potential impact of this on their own bottom line. And, and yes, in some cases, it might be possible to, uh, wa for one or two people to fly outside the, uh, the country. But firstly, there's no guarantee that it's better anywhere else. And secondly, you can't take everybody out of Nigeria. So we all have workforces here that we have to protect in Nigeria. We have to ensure that uh, we think about each part of the economy thinks about itself as part of a bigger picture. And everyone uh, put something behind us. So I, I hope my phones are on. I hope that uh, mm. I get a lot of calls mm. from people asking, listen, how can we help? Help. Okay, just as we finalize the program, uh, let us go back to coronavirus, yeah. which again is, you know, 
everyone is talking about it around the world. The last time I checked, about 26 countries have cases case, yeah. of coronavirus among developed and mostly even developed, <laughs> developed nations. But perhaps why we're also looking at it is because they adequately prepared. We're taking a look at what is happening in China. Not just one hospital, two hospitals actually within a week or within 10 days, however you, you look at it. What and what can we do now, perhaps as individuals, to, uh, to prevent it? Uh, and, you know, your final word. So I think I'll end by just going back to prevention. You mm. know, the things we can do to prevent corona, even if we don't have corona, will prevent a lot of other diseases. So the, the things that we preach about that people trivialize. So when we say people, we need to wash our hands. Um, all the time. You know, I, I've gone to schools in Nigeria, hospitals, where you find a great building, uh, you know, they must have spent millions on infrastructure, but there's no running water. You know, you go to the bathrooms of schools where, you know, so we have to go back to the basics and really uh, focus on providing the facilities and ourselves using those facilities uh, to prevent the transmission of uh, these infections. The thing with corona is unlike Lhasa, Lhasa requires um, uh, body fluids to be exchanged one way or the other for transmission to happen. Um, uh, corona is a respiratory born uh, virus uh, transmitted through droplets. So um, it's a whole new perspective altogether. So we really need to wash our hands, cover our mouths and noses when we're sneezing. And if we're ill, stay at home, you know, don't be the hero and go Stay to at work. home, I'll call you guys. Uh, well, if you think it's corona, but if you have a flu-like illness, yes. even if it's not corona, you shouldn't be at work being the hero, uh, hugging everybody, uh, kissing everybody, and uh, transmitting that virus to your whole work environment. So there's a lot that we can do ourselves to prevent the transmission of infectious diseases. And, um, you know, hygiene, uh, the basics, wash your hands. Doctor, I want to ask you this, since you're a medical doctor, how about doing like this now? If you don't find a handkerchief or a tissue paper, is it healthy to Yes, it's absolutely hair? better. The, the reason is, is our hands are mm. such uh, non-conscious transmitters of viruses. So it's much better to sneeze into your... Um, elbow? Elbow. At least you avoid your hands. So the next person you see... And, you know, we're, we're social people. But since it's airborne, wouldn't it spread that way? You know, it, it will, it, it's airborne, but it's not, um, it's transmitted by droplets. So they mm. can't go that far, far, right? So we're not saying the ideal thing is to have a tissue and after that mm -hmm. throw it away and wash your hands. Uh, so we're just saying that it's better to uh, sneeze into your elbow than on your palms. Because the challenge with us, there are cultures where people don't shake all the time, you don't hug on all the time. But in Nigeria, we do this all the time. And if you don't do it, it's seen to be offensive. So if you, if you know you don't immediately have access to water to wash your hands, it's much better to sneeze into your elbow than into your palm. Okay. The ideal thing is to sneeze into a tissue a paper, tissue and paper. throw it away, yeah. and wash your hands. Right. Yeah. Okay. One thing coming to my mind just before you go. Should we just take a look at those coming from China? How about are we also tracking those that are coming from the countries where mm. they have cases? Because we know as Nigerians, we're even travelers. Mm. Not just, okay, if you're coming from China, stay there. But are you coming from U.S.? Which area of the U.S. Ha have we confirmed? Mm. Are you coming from Nepal, from Vietnam, from Singapore, from Hong Kong, from Australia, and all of that? Yeah. So it, it is a very important point, an mm. important point for your viewers to understand. So this is why we're monitoring the situation every day at NCC. At the moment, it's only in China where we have sustained transmission. Mission. Yeah. So all the cases in all the other countries you've mentioned have either been directly from returning travelers or yeah. people that we know had contact with, people with one of those returning travelers. Exactly. So there's no ongoing transmission. But this can change at any point. So we are continuously monitoring the situation. Uh, you know, the countries at most risk are those in Asia where there's a lot of traffic mm -hmm. uh, f uh, to and from China, Hong Kong, Korea, and all the countries around. So we're continuously monitoring this. And if, our, if, if there's a need to change our advice, we will do so. Uh, so I need Nigerians to trust that we are out there to protect them and, and you know, follow us through any of our media channels. And if our advice has to change, we will immediately change it and make it uh, available to them. Why am I always asking the last question? Last, okay, this may be the last. <laughs> it's like there are more questions coming out. Yeah. Is temperature check just enough? 
at the entry points? Is the thermal check just enough? So you know, it is it just enough? I, you're a doctor, you know what I mean. Yeah. So it's a balance you know, with what we have to do. Our response always has to be proportionate to the risk. At the moment, um, we're not just doing thermal checks. We're also asking a couple of screening questions. Uh, Port Health Services are about to introduce a new form for returning travelers so that we ask them about uh, their travel history before they land and so we can check some of that. We're providing them with information on who to call if they were to fall ill afterwards. Um, so that's really a, a spectrum of activities we're carrying out. If it becomes necessary to be more aggressive, we will. But at the moment, our, from our understanding of this virus, the science, and our ability to respond, we are confident that we're doing, uh, ha we have a, a proportionate response to the virus. All right, thank you very much, Doctor, thank for coming. Doctor. I know you're very busy this time, so I appreciate you for finding time to come speak to me. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. All right, I've been speaking with uh, Dr. Chikwe Ihekwazo, the DG, NCDC, that is the Nigeria Center for Disease Control. We've been looking at the issues around coronavirus, Lassa, why you need uh, to, you know, take a look at some measures so that you don't contract some of these infectious diseases, not corona now, just normal hygiene. And the economic implications, like I said, there's a cost to everything. In fact, if you are dancing, there's a cost to it. Call me, I will, I will articulate that for you. All right, that's the much you can take on today's edition of the show. Thank you for being a part of it. Uh, be the best you can be. Be the change you want to see. I am Nancy Najib. Bye now. <laughs>